The Clone Podcast. Change your way. You write in order to change the world, knowing perfectly well that you probably can't, but also knowing that literature is indispensable to the world. The world changes according to the way people see it, and if you alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Welcome to the Quo Podcast. I'm Daniel Sleeman, and in this episode, we are discussing film as a medium for change. How can film and the arts embed attitudes and cultures of change in our everyday living and professional practices? That quote you just heard was by the writer James Baldwin, read by Sonia Mermand, Assistant Director at Diversity Arts Australia, who will be joining me a little later in the podcast. For me, the quote really captures the challenge that arts in general, and film in particular, faces especially if it aspires to go beyond me entertainment. Yara Lee is a filmmaker and activist who has dedicated her career to bringing audiences films and documentaries that spark conversation and bring about cultures of resistance. Her most recent feature is called From Trash to Treasure. Set in Lesotho, it revolves around ordinary people bringing creativity and reinvention to a new generation facing socially entrenched problems. I come from the arts and culture world. I was running the Sao Paulo International Film Festival in Brazil. And then I decided to go behind the camera and I made some short films and then a couple of feature length documentaries, also very pop culture, arts and culture. But with time, you know, you see the world out there and you're like, man, we need to use all the arts and culture for something beyond arts and culture. So I started this journey of arts and culture for activists, and I think this is going to be my raison d'etre until I drop dead because um, we really need all the tools and toys we can in order to promote you know, positive change. So I've been documenting uh, resistance movements around the world and getting inspiration from people in different corners of the world and how they make things happen, you know, through the power of the people united. And that's how Cultures of Resistance came about. I mean, the, I even made a film called Cultures of Resistance and that catalyst was the U.S. invasion of Iraq. At that point, I was just like, oh, I need to see what this means, you know, and I need to go to the other side of, <laughs> of the world because what I'm hearing here in the U.S. doesn't sound like, you know, is the correct perspective. So I went to the Middle East and I made films with Middle Eastern people about what they thought about all this U.S. foreign policy of bringing democracy to the Middle East. And it's been a very long journey. You know, I'm back in the Middle East now. I, I, I made, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I do a lot of things with Palestine, free Palestine movement. And, um, and lately I've been giving a lot of my heart and time also to the African continent. So we've been making some films there. Burkina Faso, this very small landlocked country, they, they had a whole revolution through the power of the Citizens United and they removed a despotic government president that was in power for so long just through the power of the people. So, I mean, there are amazing uh, inspirations coming from different areas of the world and I try to bring them about and get people inspired to get hands-on and proactive. You're absolutely right. Like living in Australia myself, like you do see international news, but you don't see the day to day of local lives, you know, pushing against what they see as injustice or oppression. There is just so much going on, as you said. Why do you think film is the best way to bring attention to these issues? Film is a very complete medium. You know, you have music, you have content, you have visuals and uh, poetry and history and politics. So you can touch people's hearts and minds, you know. If you write political analysis, you can have brilliant political analysis, but it's hard for people to grasp, you know, and film is a very visual and visceral experience. So I've been using that tool to bring hidden stories from different areas of the world because mainstream media, as you mentioned, you know, it still just covers the same cliche and headline news and it's always the same kind of like perspective. So I try to bring story, grassroots stories because at the end of the day, I don't think politicians will provoke change. Citizens have to provoke change. And uh, this is what I try to convince people. Let's get hands on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, when you, when you see amazing things happening in small countries, 
then you have to think, well, maybe we can do this in Australia. Maybe we can do this in, in the U.S., remove the spotted governments <laughs> through the unison of the people. So I think it's, it's a good thing, you know, to try to make people feel more empowered because I think the negative forces are kind of like big tsunamis and we always feel a little bit like frozen and, and to the point that we just don't feel we can do anything, but that's not true. You know, imagine we are more than 7 billion people. If we united, we could provoke change. (laughs) One of the problems independent filmmakers face is striking the balance between commercial appeal and artistic vision, a vision that has something to say either in explicit terms or in subtle psychological ways. And I'm thinking particularly here about representation. Last year, whilst I was attending the Lebanese Film Festival in Canberra, I had the chance to watch a film by Paul Barakat called Kairos. It's a film that casts an actor with Down syndrome named Chris Bunton. I asked Paul what drove him to make the film. The idea stemmed from a childhood memory. It had to do with my cousin in Lebanon. She was a lot older than me. She sustained brain damage following a childhood accident. And it was the first time I met her. I didn't even know who she was. And, um, you know, it was the first time to Lebanon as well. And the war was going on at the time. You know, we're talking about the height of the civil war in the 80s. And so I was sort of, it was a very foreign culture to me. You know, in a sense, I didn't really understand much about it. But uh, what was intriguing was that um, I ended up meeting her along with my other members of the family and, and, and sort of relatives. And she was just trying to, you know, play with the kids. And uh, she couldn't communicate clearly. There was a sort of a different way of handling, I think, people that had intellectual disabilities in terms of the way that they were treated within the in the society. I don't think there was a sort of enough knowledge around it uh, at the time. So she kind of grew up in the village and, you know, she was just trying to play with us, basically. She wanted to join in on this game. You know, I remember just sensing the atmosphere change around us. You know, it's like sort of the adults kind of got a little bit um, fearful um, of, you know, because it was sort of for them an unpredictable situation. And I remember being bothered by that a little bit, I think, on some level, on a deep level. I was only about eight. And that stuck with me. It stuck with me for a long time in terms of how people... I started noticing how people treated people with intellectual disabilities, whether it was over there or whether it was in Australia, I sense this sort of discomfort. And I think it comes from the lack of integration in society at that time, um, particularly through education and uh, and also the lack of sort of inclusivity in other parts of whether or not I started to put those things together. And then by the time I got to, you know, my late teens, I realised that there was sort of like this distinct lack of sort of representation, you know, in a way not to reduce uh, or to... Um, you know, I guess uh, to make it a reductive comparison, but like in my own experiences as a young Lebanese Australian growing up, being exposed, I guess, to the the subculture of, of sort of sometimes of the uh, of, of, of racism and prejudice in that way. You know, I knew what it was like. I felt what it was like to be an outsider. So film is a commercial product. It's there to obviously be successful commercially, but also it's it's an art form. It's a way of telling a story and a and, uh, perspective and perhaps educating people, as you've kind of alluded to. How do you balance that commercial reality and the the artistic vision? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I've seen films, you know, dealing with similar subject matter that came out around the same time, you know, um, that have done really well commercially. I think because they're presenting the idea in that sort of almost Aesop's fable you know, kind of context, you know, and and it's easy to digest, I think, those sort of stories. But I was always very clear from the beginning when we were making our film that I didn't want it to be, you know, I didn't want it to offer any easy answers. And therefore, I knew that my audience may, may have narrowed a little, in a way. But I had faith that, I guess, that ultimately, these sort of films end up finding their audience over time. And I've noticed that with Kairos, that it wasn't like a box office hit or anything like that. But I feel like there's people talking about it, in, you know, that may not have been talking about it, you know, this particular issue before. And uh, people come across it and uh, people are coming across it and discovering it for the first time and writing the emails from, you know, all corners of the world. And it's just kind of this really interesting sort of um, development that's happening with the film, I guess, slowly. And I always trusted that that would happen. So it's, it's hard. I mean, commercialism is important you do have to think about your market and I'm, i mean i teach films so i'm always teaching my students to think of the market or at least stand by your decisions and know the kind of film you're making so if you're going to make this art house sort of film then know that 
you, you're only going to you can only expect to have a certain level of response from it. You know, it's not going to be this box office hit. But if you want to appeal to a broader audience, you need to sort of create a, a framework that draws them in a little more. We try to do that a little bit. I think I think our film sort of toes the line a little bit there um, because we use the boxing subgenre of sports drama as a framework for this film. And in a way, it was to try and, you know, entice people to come and watch it because they recognised those sort of archetypes, you know, from from those sort of genres and, and those sort of patterns in those stories. And then in the end, what we did was sort of deliver a completely different experience and sort of undermine the tropes of that genre by by you know changing the leading man in a way, as it were. One of the great things about Yara's films is that you can watch most of them online for free through the Cultures of Resistance website. In fact, that's where I watched their latest feature, From Trash to Treasure. For an activist like herself, the commercial aspect of filmmaking is secondary to the cause. Well, at the beginning, I, I just thought as an artist, as someone who works hard and, you know, films do cost, even when you make them very low budget. But at that, at some point, I just decided to, you know, to compartmentalize. I'll do some commercial work on one side and then I'll make my films strictly, you know, as pure as possible, not tainted by commercialists or even trying to appeal to mainstream audiences. And that has been the right decision because at the end of the day, if you taint your art with the commercialist, it's, it's no longer art, it's no longer from the heart, it's no longer real, you know. And uh, I tend to choose subjects that are very fringe and, and very off the radar and that makes them even less commercial. <laughs> So the funny thing is that at the end of the day, there is audience for everything. You know, you can have niche places where you find your audience. I was telling a friend today, like, even if you like chili pepper and you make a film about chili pepper, you'll find an audience of people who like chili pepper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I make films about obscure things. And little by little, we find our audiences. And uh, I've been happy to just show our films in festivals, in the basement, in the classroom, at university, you know, sometimes in a big festival, sometimes in a very tiny one, and everything counts. Lately, with COVID, we moved everything online, and, you know, it was traumatic, but at the end of the day, it was like, wow, it makes sense, because our audience is small, but all over the world, and it's hard to bring them to venues. So by putting the films, launching the films online, we got like the numbers that we would not be able to get if we had physical venue screenings. So it turned out that this negative became a positive for us. And uh, so we're always just trying to kind of use social media and very grassroots ways of reaching our audiences and building slowly but surely, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in big numbers, mainstream audience, because our films will never interest those big numbers, you know, because as you said, it's not entertainment, purely entertainment. But, you know, just conquering hearts and minds little by little and sparking people to get more interested in action on the ground. <laughs> You're listening to The Quo Podcast. I'm Daniel Sleeman. It seems like diversity is that word that just doesn't seem to want to go away. And for good reason, especially when it comes to media representation. What is change if it falls short of inclusion? And how can storytelling benefit in this push for cultural change? Sonia Mermand is Assistant Director with Diversity Arts Australia and works across both policy and artistic production. We are, we are an advocacy group. So that means that we, we work to support people who identify as being uh, from migrant and refugee backgrounds. Uh, and cow backgrounds, people of color. But we do that not so much from a grassroots level because there are so many organizations that do that uh, grassroots kind of work. But we represent those grassroots orgs in a sense. We do like the research and the, uh, yeah, the quantitative and qualitative research that is kind of needed to speak to government and to eventually make policy change. Um, and we do do work directly with artists, but the remit is always some sort of outcome that can affect policy change. We don't deny that like the art itself is is research. It's you know the practice of creative production is is a form of research, you know, you're you're exploring new ways of seeing the world, of acting, of being, of working and and so we like we have a project called Diverse Screens which we've run in Parramatta in 
Southwest Sydney and in City of Sydney so far. And it's a project that works with filmmakers. And we, we basically give filmmakers a prompt. We ask them to make a film that addresses diversity in the arts in some capacity. And we've gotten some amazing responses. You know, we had a, a film that by Maria Tran, a Fairfield-based filmmaker, who uh, she took that theme and she made a mockumentary and she like exposed kind of the racist side of Hollywood and kind of made fun of it along the way, um, you know, made you laugh and made you cringe. <laughs> um, it was a film that was about a an Asian superhero and the director is giving him all kinds of like problematic notes and to, you know, towards the end of the film, they ask him to just like stop talking, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's like, it's, it, and it, it speaks to people. Like this is like a commentary on, real stuff that affects a lot of artists, a lot of creatives. And, but it's done in a way that, you know, we had that film screened on a big public screen in a Westfield in, in Fairfield, I believe. And um, a few, we had it also screened at Fed, Fed Square. Uh, we have a partnership with this like public screen organization. So, you know, like they have a big public appeal, but they also have really specific um, policy changing messages uh or at least messages that you know aim for policy change that along with others like you know there was one that pearl tan made about mental health and uh culturally diverse artists and specifically you know addressing issues of how feeling like a marginalized community within the creative sector can have a toll on someone's mental health you know and it's done in this really like compelling way that you know, humanizes people that maybe for, you know, some people have never really seen a cald creative as fully human, maybe because they've never gotten the chance to sit down and know their work, you know. You touched on an interesting point about the arts being a research project that reflects self-identification or our sense of self and I guess our place in the world. How do you think film can embed a culture for change or activism so film has a particularly special place in my heart because film and TV, because I've just always been a big film and TV junkie. <laughs> um, like I used, that was like the first line of, you know, discipline when I get in trouble as a kid was take away the TV. Um, it was like, you know, the worst thing you could do to me. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a window into someone else's world and someone else's perspective. And I mean, but, Many other art forms do this, you know, literature, visual arts, dance, music, they're all, you know, they all have this amazing potential to offer diverse creatives to tell stories like on their terms, but, you know, their stories on their own terms. And that goes beyond CALD. It's disability, LGBTQ, so many other communities who've been misrepresented. And I think also having that diversity in the arts, it challenges that idea that there is a mainstream, you know, people just want good stories. They want multidimensional stories. They want specific stories. And I think ultimately when, when you humanize people, when you tell, when you show them as like fully multidimensionally flawed and everything, it, it just, it just makes for, it makes for a better story. First of all, I mean, a better movie period, but also like it makes it so you can't judge someone as harshly when they're different from you. It's just harder, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And I think particularly at darts, you know, like we hear so many stories of creatives who have just been, you know, like denied so many opportunities in the sector and they just, they just want a chance to tell their stories at the end of the day. And, throwing in more variety in the ring is only going to make things better. The film Kairos was the first film I had watched which starred a person with a disability in a lead role. I asked Paul Barakat on why he thought that was and about the multi-dimensionality and richness of character that he sought to bring out in the lead actor. Up until the, the time Kairos came out, I think I'd only noticed, I think there was probably one or two other films I'd, I'd come across in the past that I 
I'd heard of, but I had, they weren't in wide release, so it was very difficult to sort of get a hold of them and, and, and watch them. And I think the only thing I can think of, the only film I could actually think of that comes to mind was a film called The Eighth Day, which was a French film, a French-Belgian production uh, with Daniel Oteil. And, um, you know, there was a, a chap in there with, uh, with Down syndrome, but it was sort of, had this sort of magic realism to it. And it wasn't, I, I think, again, it was this sort of Rain Man-esque, you know, journey, and 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 it was about the character with Down syndrome sort of serving almost as a catalyst for the main character as he and and as he allows that main character to to change the way he sees the world and be transformed by his experience encountering this beautiful person with Down syndrome. And I felt like people with disabilities have always on screen seem to be reduced to that tokenistic role, you know, or a, or a background role or a, a role where there's a sort of a magical quality or something, you know, and I kind of found that a little bit, you know, it bothered me a little bit. It was kind of that sort of trope that comes back in cinema often, and I felt like I really wanted to challenge that by, first of all, presenting someone with Down syndrome in, in a film that had a very complex and rich uh, emotional experience in life that, that was not this angelic sort of being that was actually just this, like, red-blooded, you know, male that, that, that sort of had the same desires and goals and obstacles as, as anyone else, you know, his age. And, and, and I thought that was really important. So I think the problem with it, with it is, in particular, is that, again, it goes back to that lack of inclusion. It goes back to the lack of education surrounding it and giving people, um, you know, the more people get to understand um, you know, and know about other cultures and about um, other communities within their own community, the more, you know, these sort of things and these sort of characters start to appear on screen in sort of uh, meaningful roles. And I think that's the problem. It's just a lack of education, a lack of exposure, where, you know, even up until a few years ago, the Special Olympics wasn't even being aired on national television. And I just, I, I can't fathom that. You know, I can't understand that. There's a sort of almost like a unconscious bias, you know, from 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 a lot of, People in not only just in the media, society in general, who basically underestimate the capabilities of people with Down syndrome, and I think that's that was the point of this film. I didn't want this to be, oh, here's this main character with Down syndrome, and he inspires everyone around him, and you know, it's not about that. It's it's it's, it's about these people facing um, their own challenges. I mean, we are operating within the context of drama, a narrative drama, a fictional drama, and so it was important that all the characters struggle to achieve their goals or pursue their goals regardless of their abilities. You know, that was one of the key driving forces behind it, which would allow the story to be really human. Are we going to get to a time when diversity becomes the norm rather than an ongoing urgency? And how is Australia faring when it comes to diverse representation? Here is Sonia Mermund again. Well, I think Australia is... I think that there are enough conversations happening that like it's getting there. And I think especially in film and TV, you know, I think there are enough critical voices coming out um, through social media, through. Yeah. I think, I think that there is, there is definitely hope for change. I mean, even, you know, I worked at the um, equity foundation and I coordinated their inaugural diversity showcase. And it was a showcase for culturally diverse For people, yeah, from culturally diverse backgrounds, uh, people with disability or LGBTQI. And it was across acting, writing, and directing. So we we recruited creatives and they came together and they put together this show. And it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to watch. They put together this amazing show and in a week. (laughs) And we invited industry and there was a lot of enthusiasm. You know, we invited casting directors and um, producers and people from the major networks. And there was so much enthusiasm. And I do think like, I see the actors from, and the writers, directors from that cohort, and they have, they have come a long way from that showcase. I don't, I don't know if it was, I think the showcase definitely gave them a lot of visibility. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there is, there has been progress. You know, you look at shows like the family law, you know, that, it's you know the cast the crew like there was so much diversity in there and you could tell because the stories were good (laughs) it was a good show like the outcome is 
it's just better. <laughs> you know, you can't write about something you don't know. And so it's, it's better for everyone. When, when people try to block out Cal to creatives, it's, it's to their detriment. They're going to lose money. Like the outcome is not going to be as, as good period. Sharing stories for change should be the means rather than the end. The conversation doesn't stop once the camera stops. People's lives don't stop off camera. Their stories, their struggles, and their creative output continues. Here's Yara Lee. Just last week, we created this uh, uh, Creative Activism Award, you know, because one of the things that is very important to me is also to be long-term relationship with the people I film. I don't like to just take their stories and leave them behind as I found them. You know, I like to kind of kind of work with them. And uh, so we created this small award, like seed funding, so they can continue doing the work they started that we documented in our film. So I'm very excited about that. And they're very excited, too, because at the end of the day, just exposing is not enough. People want some sort of like more solid support, you know? And that I learned also many years ago when I was making a film about the Afghan refugees in, in Pakistan. And when I got there with my crew, they started shooting with the Kalishnikov and throwing stones at us, you know? I was like, oh, I'm here trying to document you guys to tell your story. And they started yelling, every day we have journalists, photographers and filmmakers and nothing changes for us, you know? We are fed up of you guys. And that was also like, you know, a wake up call that you just photograph and document is not enough. And that's why I started the Cultures of Resistance Foundation. So parallel to the media coverage, we also try to work with them long term. And that has been amazing. So I'm still in touch with people from Western Sahara, with Burkina Faso, and now Lesotho, and all the people that are in our film, the porters from K2 film and... Uh, and uh, yeah, it's like a big family. <laughs> that was Yara Lee from Cultures of Resistance Films. And you can find and watch their films at www.culturesofresistance.com. You can also find Paul's film Kairos online through digital platforms. Thanks to Paul, Yara and Sonia Mermand from Diversity Arts Australia. I'm Daniel Sleeman and you have been listening to The Quo Podcast.